Thanks for your patience and waiting. I finally got round to making the second video in this two-part series on St Edward's Crown. In this second part today, I'm going to look at the present-day St Edward's Crown, the crown that was used at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, and we can assume, though we don't know for certain, will also be used to crown King Charles III in May. Now, if you've landed here not having seen my first video on St Edward's Crown, please do go and watch that now, as it sets the scene for this video. It explains why England, and later the United Kingdom, has a separate coronation crown that is worn only once, and a second state crown that is worn more often. It also explains why it is called St Edward's Crown, and how it began life as a holy relic. And also go and watch my video on the Imperial State Crown, which explains what that crown is, when it is used, and why it has that particular name. Then come back here and watch this video, and it will make much more sense. Now, the first St Edward's Crown was destroyed during the Commonwealth in the middle of the 17th century. It was taken to the Tower of London, and what jewels it contained were sold off, and the gold, we can assume with no evidence to the contrary, was then melted down and minted into coins. When the monarchy was restored in 1660 and Charles II returned to his throne, there was therefore no royal regalia for him to wear for his coronation, and it was necessary to start from scratch and create new crowns and new regalia. A committee was formed with the king in the chair to organise the coronation, and one of the issues discussed at the first meeting of that committee in September of 1660 was what sort of regalia was now required. Charles II was not a minimalist. Despite England having been a republic for some years, the new monarchy was not going to be a pared-down affair. During his exile, he had been based just outside Paris, and had been at the court of his cousin Louis XIV of France, where he had seen the developing splendour of the French court. He was of the view that under his watch, the English court was going to be just as splendid, and much more splendid than the court of his father, King Charles I. After years of Puritan killjoy misery, people were in need of a little bit of splendour. That desire for splendour was reflected in the new confident royal regalia that was commissioned, which was far more splendid than the medieval and Tudor regalia it replaced. Sir Edward Walker, who was Garter King of Arms, the chief herald, and had been exiled on the continent with the king, was the expert who was consulted on what was required. It was he that recommended that the regalia should replicate the collection of the past, that there should be a St Edward's crown, used for the coronation alone, and a separate state crown, an imperial crown, for other occasions. So the curious situation occurred in Protestant England of the Protestant establishment recreating a lost crown that was chiefly significant because it had been a holy relic, and doing so not because it was necessary, nor because of its religious associations, but because to do so created a sense of continuity between the pre-Civil War past and the post-Restoration present. The purpose of the new regalia was to give the impression that things were carrying on as normal, as though the Republican experiment had never happened. Note too that from the Restoration this crown is called St Edward's Crown. The title, King Alfred's Crown, that made the crown slightly more palatable in the years directly after the English Reformation, was dropped entirely. The person whose job it was to create the new regalia was officially the master of the jewel house, Sir Gilbert Talbot, who was a politician, but he delegated the job of recreating the crown jewels to someone who better knew what they were doing, and that person was Sir Robert Viner. Sir Robert Viner wasn't actually a goldsmith or a craftsman of any description, he was a banker. He was a partner in a major banking company in the City of London that had been established in the early 17th century by his uncle, Sir Thomas Viner. This is Sir Thomas's monument, once in St Mary Woolnoth in the City of London, now at the Viner's uh, former country seat at Gortby in Lincolnshire. 
Sir Robert was to inherit this company from his uncle. Sir Robert Viner was in essence a middleman. He received the commission and then tendered out the work to various craftsmen. The reason he was chosen was quite simply that he had the right connections, but more importantly, he had the means and the credit at his disposal to make the king's dreams a reality without needing to be paid for them immediately. The new regalia commissioned from Sir Robert Viner cost a staggering £12,184, 7 shillings and sixpence. The same cost as fitting out three warships. Viner was sworn in as a member of the Goldsmiths Company in order to be able to take on this job. He could then outsource the work and then have it assayed at Goldsmiths Hall in his name. It is very sad that we don't really know anything about the skilled craftsmen who produced the crowns and the new regalia. They remain anonymous, but they were at the very top of their craft and English goldsmiths' work in this period was superb. Sir Robert Viner was one of a group of goldsmith bankers who were bankrolling Charles II, whose expenditure was greater than his potential revenue during the 1660s. In 1672, the king placed a stop on the exchequer to try and get his finances under control. Although Viner managed to have an annuity granted to him of £25,000 per annum, the stop on the exchequer pretty much bankrupted him. On top of this, he was never seemingly fully reimbursed for the bill he submitted for the crowns and the rest of the regalia. They are probably still unpaid for. When plans were being finalised in 1660 for the creation of a new St Edward's crown, no one seemed to remember what the original St Edward's crown looked like. Until it was destroyed, it had been locked up in Westminster Abbey and hadn't been used since the coronation of Charles I in 1626. There were few alive who had knowingly seen it. So in 1660, the new St Edward's crown was not a replica of the old, but was made in precisely the same form as the state crown. And the new state crown was an updated form, in essence, of the Tudor state crown. Now you can see in this engraving that shows the regalia from the coronation of James II that the two crowns are in fact nearly identical, except for the setting of the stones. Both the state crown and St Edward's crown consisted of a circlet with alternating crosses patty and fleur-de-lis. Both crowns are what are termed closed or imperial crowns, which means on top of the circlet, the band, are four arches like the crowns of Byzantine emperors, which are then surmounted by a mond, a globe, which is in turn topped with another cross. Now the state crown has of course been remade time and time again, has been considerably redesigned in the 19th century. So the present imperial state crown doesn't any longer resemble St Edward's crown at all. In the planning stages in 1660, it was suggested that the new St Edward's crown should be made of gold with very few jewels. But Charles II insisted on something a little more lavish. In the interests of some economy, as St Edward's crown was only to be used for the coronation and then placed in the jewel house, it was decided that it would not be set with its own permanent collection of stones. Viner hired a set of stones for Charles I's coronation at a cost of £500. These were set in the crown for the coronation and then afterwards returned to their owners. It was splendour on the cheap and this would happen at every single coronation until 1911. Stones were hired, they were set into Edward's crown, they were removed after the coronation, given back to their owners again and then the unset crown frame was placed in the jewel house until it was needed at the next coronation. The restoration of the monarchy coincided with the development of the rich Baroque style of art and architecture, and St Edward's crown, though traditional, is also very much a Baroque piece of work. For a start, the crown is unusually tall, much uh, taller than earlier English crowns, and this shows off the inner velvet cap of maintenance. 
The way the arches curve outward from the band and then curve downwards in a depression in the centre is also an innovation. That gives the crown a more spreading form that looks better aesthetically on the head of King Charles II with his shoulder length wig. A shorter and narrower crown would be somewhat visually lost uh, set on top of such a hairpiece. Originally, the state crown had a similar form, and we can see it here on the head of the king. The individual settings of the jewels and the crown also show Baroque influence. They are in the form of acanthus sleeves, and they add a rich flourish and decadence to the crown that was certainly not a feature of the original uh, pre-Civil War relic. So Nobus crown was considerably refurbished for the coronation of King George V in 1911. Kings no longer wore voluminous wigs. <laughs> the band was far too big for a 20th century head. The band was therefore reduced in size, the crown being reduced at the same time in weight from 82 to 71 troy ounces, so a considerable amount of gold was removed. Originally, the arches and the band had been decorated with a string of imitation pearls, but these were replaced now by gold beads that were then plated with platinum, though the platinum plating is no longer very obvious. Interestingly, Royal Heraldry has not been updated to reflect these 1911 changes, and the strings of pearls that were formerly on the arches are still shown on the heraldic version of the crown. The present 444 precious and semi-precious stones that the crown is studded with were taken from the Royal Collection in 1911. 1911 was, of course, the height of the British Empire, and the royal family had access for the first time to an unrivaled collection of stones, particularly from uh, the Indian subcontinent. The stones consist of larger step-cut stones and clusters of rose-cut smaller gems. The majority of the stones are aquamarines, but there are also white topazes, tourmalines, rubies, amethysts, sapphires, jargoons. There's a garnet, a spinel, and a carbuncle. There are no diamonds, of course, which really contrasts St Edward's crown with the present incarnation of the imperial state crown, which is, of course, mostly set with diamonds. Although the rest of the regalia made of the restoration has seen service in every coronation, St Edward's crown has been very little used since it was made. It was used for the coronations of Charles II, James II and William III in the 17th century, but from the coronation of Queen Anne in 1702 until that of George V in 1911, it wasn't used at all. All the Hanoverians, except George IV, were crowned with the state crown. George IV thought he was extra special, so he had a new coronation crown made for himself, um, which was only used the once. Uh, what a ridiculous person he was. When Edward VII came to the throne in 1901, the intention was that St Edward's crown would be revived for his coronation. He was to be crowned on the 26th of June 1902, but a few days prior to that date he developed appendicitis, and the coronation was then delayed until August. He had not properly recovered by August, and the decision was made to crown him instead with the slightly lighter imperial state crown made for his mother in 1837 which the 80-year-old and nearly blind Archbishop of Canterbury, Frederick Temple, very nearly dropped and then put on the king's head the wrong way round. Which incidentally is a major issue with St Edward's crown. Unlike the imperial crown, which has a large and characteristic stone on the front, the Black Prince's ruby, which Archbishop Temple clearly missed, the stones in St Edward's crown are identical on the front and the back. At the coronation of King George VI in 1937, Archbishop Lang was seen to fumble with the crown while he tried to work out which was the front and which was the back. A bit of red cotton had been tied to the front of the crown to prevent this happening. By the time the crown was in Archbishop Lang's hands, some busybody had removed it. King George VI was convinced that the crown was placed the wrong way round. 
During its many centuries of disuse, the crown was still present at the coronation. Set with its hired stones, it was brought in during the procession and it was deposited on the high altar of Westminster Abbey. One of the traditions that has been continued throughout is the right of the Dean of Westminster to bring in the crown before the coronation, a right that dates back to the Middle Ages and to the time when the original relic crown, with the original St Edward's crown, was in the care and keeping of the Dean and his predecessors, the Abbots of Westminster. The crown, along with the rod with the dove and the scepter with the cross, which, as we will see in later videos, are all reincarnations of Edward the Confessor's grave goods, are brought from the deanery, the medieval abbot's house of Westminster, early in the morning of the day of the coronation by the dean and canons, and are placed for a time on the high altar before being taken again by them to the west end of the abbey for the entrance procession of the sovereign. Now in my next video on the coronation, I'm going to look at other elements of the regalia, particularly the scepters, the rods and the orb, and their making, their meaning and their purpose. Then we'll be at a point to be able to discuss how all of these objects of regalia are used in the coronation ceremony. Thanks very much indeed for watching. If you enjoy my YouTube channel, please do take the time to like and to share. If you feel able to support the channel financially, you can do that via PayPal or the website Buy Me A Coffee. Any donations I receive through those means will be put to good use, upgrading my equipment and to improve the quality of the video content I offer. Thanks very much indeed for all your help and support.